All right. Thanks for everyone coming back and uh, rushing through your lunch. Hopefully it was good from Whole Foods Market, one of our sponsors. So really excited to have Suzanne on uh, the stage today because she pr provides a unique kind of point of view being both a CMO and a CEO. And we're going to get into the relationship between sales and marketing and how to make it successful. And we're going to talk a lot about data. But first, I really, Suzanne, I wanted you to talk about uh, the role of CMO, of the C-suite roles. It seems like it's the hardest one to really define. And before hiring somebody for that role, whether you're a CEO or coming into the company, it's probably critical to define it properly. It, it is, and everyone has a different definition. In fact, let me just, I, and I apologize, I'm gonna go probably backwards for, for some of you because you've done this exercise, I imagine, earlier. How many of you are marketing people? How many of you are salespeople? How many of you do both? Interesting, okay, thank you for that. So, it's a good question, Vince, because um, what we've learned is that every organization has a different need for marketing, and every organization has a different definition of marketing. And what's critical to any organization is to understand what the true marketing need is that they have and then to hire to it. What we've learned over the years, and, and actually there's a terrific Harvard Business Review article that I encourage all of you to read. It's called The Trouble with CMOs. And just take 10 minutes out of your time and find the trouble with CMOs and, and read the article. We'll, we'll pull apart a couple of the, the important pieces here today. Um, there are two kinds of CMO. There is your traditional CMO that's sort of a transactional person um, he or she is tactical. Um, I write marketing campaigns, I build databases, I manage a top of funnel, um, I move all the pieces in order to help deliver leads to sales so that they can transact and, and, and finish the deal. And then you have your strategic CMO who is far closer to the revenue. You measure a strategic CMO based on um, also the revenue that you're bringing in for the company. I'm not just passing a lead over the wall, I am partnering with you, the sales team, and understanding which leads are the right ones, which ones close for you, so I can do better top of funnel work over here. And don't measure me on the number of leads I'm generating, measure me on the revenue of the company. A strategic CMO is very cross-functional. He or she works not only with sales, but with operations to understand the volume of goods that could be sold because we can handle the manufacturing of them on the back end. Um, they work very closely with the finance folks to understand what margins should look like and how you price them and what, what can the market bear as far as price points go. All of these require an intersection between marketing and all of the organizations across your company. What we're learning is that only 25% of CMOs are in fact the strategic CMO. And so the other 75% fall in this transactional bucket. And this is where the disconnect happens with the CEO. What CEOs are looking for is the CMO that's strategic. And what they don't know is how to hire that CMO. They're not looking for the skill set. Too often what we're doing, Vince, is we're looking for the CMO in our industry. Or a VP of marketing that I can rise to CMO and I love you because you happen to come from the business to business software world. And because you know B2B software, you're gonna be my great CMO. Maybe, maybe not. Industry, I think, can be taught. What can't be taught is this, the strong principles of how marketing fits across the entire organization. If you need a lead generator, hire a lead generator. But if you need someone that's going to help your business grow incrementally, hire someone that has already demonstrated the skills of building market share, building revenue, being a collaborative force across the organization that's partnered deeply with sales. Too often we lose the opportunity to hire that person. So you personally, obviously, as you gained experience, I assume at one point you might have been more transactional, and then you became more strategic as you gained more experience and learned, you know, how do I really help the company grow as opposed right. to how do I add leads to the top of the funnel? We all do. So you start out as a young marketing person, you're, you're sort of pigeonholed into something, you run social media, you run PR, you do your bits and pieces. Um, if you aspire to become a CMO, you make sure that you're very quickly moving along and, and grabbing more parts of marketing, right? And if you do it well, as you grow up to the top of marketing and you become that VP, you're grabbing other parts of the business. Let me own how product is packaging product and bringing it forward. Let me own the market research that informs the product. So now all of a sudden product management and product marketing live inside of the marketing organization. Now you're becoming more that strategic and collaborative CMO. You can 
work your way there, but you have to ask for it. Because the organization isn't going to come forward and say, hey, you marketing person, why don't you do more? You have to stand up and you have to ask. So most of your career has been in B2B, and you've right. been at some pretty big organizations here in the triangle and outside. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how did you start the relationship with sales? As mm -hmm. sometimes you've seen organizations where there's animosity between the two groups, so they're not coordinated, right? Mm -hmm. So talk to me about the things you've done as a strategic CMO to make sure this relationship starts off on the right foot or eventually becomes a partnership. So I have, um, I think it's maybe a little untraditional, but I have asked to be measured on the revenue, not asked to be measured on the leads. I can use the leads as a data point, but ultimately I want sales to understand that we're partners here together to one singular end. If you're working on two different ends, I'm measured on the top of funnel and you're measured on the revenue over here that's converting, it just creates a situation where you can finger point. I didn't have enough leads, therefore I didn't convert. I didn't convert because of whatever. It, it, it just became, uh, it becomes a he said, she said type situation. If you are in it together and you're all measured on the same metrics, it becomes a very different playing field. So yes, there's leads at the top, and yes, there's revenue at the bottom, but in the middle is this amazing collection of data that you share. And if you don't share the data together and you don't create the right data together, neither end is gonna work. The data and making data-driven decisions is what makes for successful sales at the end of the day. And so what I've learned is if we can partner together on the data that we're utilizing in order to create business, it's a win for everyone. So imagine marketing is putting leads into a funnel and in those leads, they're baking in the criteria that sales have asked for because now we know the data about the consumers that convert or the customer that converts. If I now can look for the customer that converts and I add that to the top of the funnel, everything's gonna flow better but it doesn't work unless sales is putting the data in the system about the customers after they buy. So this means that the CRM system that you choose or you're implementing is critical to in sharing of this data? I don't care about the CRM system. I care that you have one. Any CRM system will do. Or, gosh, I'm okay if you live off a spreadsheet if you have to. What's critical is the data and the quality of data. So too often what I have found in my path is that Marketing does all the work of all these leads, but we don't know if they really convert and it's just stuff that spits out the back end. If sales is adding in and doing their part and saying, this one worked and here's why. This one did not work and here's why. I want 10 more of this kind of customer because their path to close is three clicks. And this one over here has 15 clicks to close. Give me more of the three, right? I want more cowbell, right? Tell me what your cowbell is and then I can go and I can manage to the cowbell. But if you're not in the CRM system saying, here's what it looks like, I don't know how to market to it. So I'm gonna do the, the spray as opposed to the very segmented and personalized and careful selection of the leads that go in. It's kind of like going to a trade show, right? Let me, let me give you an analogy. So you go to a trade show and you give away tchotchkes and you take part in the, the event where people have to go and stamp the card and in order to come by your booth and they stamp the card, you know, then they get to have a tchotchke and they get to get in a giveaway, right? You know what that creates? A bunch of junk in your database. It's the last thing you want. And then marketing's gonna say, we did great because we have hundreds and hundreds of leads at the top and sales on the other end is gonna say, I couldn't convert any of these people. But if you instead segment and personalize and very clearly articulate what you need at the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel moves really fast and you close and you have the right customers in it. And you're not churning the customer on the other end. Sales is happy because if you measure them on churn, which is an important one on the sales side, measure marketing on it too. Did you put one in the funnel that eventually a salesperson closed because they're just a good salesperson, but they turn out to be a one-year customer and you know that your return on investment on your customer is maybe 18 months to two, but after a year they got out of their subscription. Well, that's not a win for anyone. Yes, you got the one-year revenue, but you took all that time to get that customer up to speed and they walked away anyway. It was the wrong customer to put in your funnel. Marketing's not gonna know that unless sales tells you and it's the data in the middle that makes for that successful organization. So, uh, so how do you collaborate with sales to make sure that one, they're entering it and then two, that they're communicating back? Because some of this is communication besides the CRM system, right? It's your it relationship with the head of sales and the revenue, new business revenue generation team, right? Yeah, it's, it's strategic discussions. It, and it is measurement of data. 
So it's evaluation of the customers that came out the back end, and it's working your way back on the analytics to say which ones worked and which ones didn't, and what is that path to close? What's the ultimate path to close? What's the demographic and the makeup of the customer that is the ultimate customer? And then you use that to, to go fill the top of the funnel. And it's the dialogue and the data together that gets you there. If you're not partnered in that dialogue, then uh, none of it's gonna come together. Again, you're gonna be the, you know, at the, at the spray side of things, and you're just gonna be hitting your head against the wall and not doing a whole lot of closing, right? Can you provide an example, I'm sure this happened to you throughout your career somewhere, where things just weren't working, meaning mm. you thought there was an uh, interpretation that marketing was delivering the right type of prospects, and sales is like, oh, they're not the right type of prospects, and eventually came to a head, and you had to correct it. Something along those lines where things weren't working, you had to, had to address it and had to fix it. Is there a specific example that comes to mind for you? Yeah, so um, by the way, this is very, very ad lib because I was not expecting this question. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna give you a very specific one. So Vince is good at this. He just kind of throws a, throws a, a new one at you. Um, I had a circumstance where I did not have, I was on the CMO side of the house, um, trying very hard to partner with sales, but they were kind of off doing their own thing. And we didn't have a clear profile of the customer. And we filled the funnel with lots and lots of little customers that were sort of um, at the very early stage of needing the solution. And they were easy to get because they were hungry for how technology might make them get the hockey stick. Right? So it was easy to market to them. They're like fledgling little birds. And oh God, here, let me feed you a little something because I can tell you how you're gonna double your business. It was easy marketing fodder, right? And so I did my job. Yeah. The volume of leads coming in was terrific. What happened was sales could also convert them. And then on the back end, we had virtually no revenue because we had a sliding scale and we had to do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the little guys where I could have just closed one of the big dogs and the right dog, and then he or she would have stuck around as opposed to the several dozens to hundreds that eventually turned out. And the churn became insurmountable to the point where eventually we had to partner with the finance department and work on the numbers and use the data of the churn to identify and explain, here's the floor that we must create for this customer that's coming in the door. Marketing, don't go sell to these guys because the churn rate's too high and it's unhealthy for the business. So it was finance and sales and marketing as three legs to the stool on this one that actually turned it all around. It took a whole year and a half to do it. And we had to purge a database full of people. And I can't tell you how hard it is to know that you can turn those things on. You're a salesperson, you're gonna go and you're gonna get them. But we took them out of the database because they were the wrong thing for the business. And what you need is a sales organization that's willing to say, I'm ready to walk away from these potential sales that I could potentially make and I can walk away with a paycheck this month and a really great bonus, but I know it's the wrong thing for the business and so I'm gonna let that guide my, my, my activity. That's a good one and I'm sorry to put it on the spot, but I, I guarantee you that happens a lot and we've all seen that where, well, we we're closing great deals, but mm, not really because they're walking out in 12, exactly. 18 months. Exactly. Um, moving forward a little bit, I'm curious, is there a similarity or relationship or experience that you take it from B2B that mm -hmm. translates, now you're at a consumer brand, right? Right. What, what have you taken with you now that you're <laughs> at a consumer-facing brand? Yeah, on the surface you'd say, why is this woman the CEO yeah. over this company? Um, just a little bit of background, I gave a little bit in the video. Um, I, I did come from B2B, so um, primarily enterprise software. Some big companies, Computer Associates, SAP, um, but more mid-tier, um, I think my sweet spot for my years in B2B was uh, a company like SideQuest um, uh, and then eventually uh, Channel Advisor. And so uh, four to 500, maybe up to 800 people, um, $100 million in revenue, mid-market sized companies. And um, all of a sudden, I, I took a board seat here at Charles and Colbard um, because I was coming from Channel Advisor and I could advise this company, a manufacturer of rocks, basically, they create uh, gemstones um, that are lab created right here in the triangle, so very ethically sourced gemstones. And their traditional model was to sell them through a distribution network. So we didn't do the job of even marketing or selling, we just had big distributors that would go in and sell these things. And so I'm not a fit whatsoever for this company, right? But I am because it was incumbent on this brand 
to bring forward the marketing and the sales activities to go direct to consumer. After 20 years in existence, this company had built a $20 million uh, market cap, virtually nothing. And it's because the, the company didn't build its own brand. And so what we learned after I came on board is that what they really needed was branding and supply chain, which happened to be in the background, um, and e-commerce, which happened to be in my background, but the use of software and technology to catapult this retail brand forward. And it's, it's kind of fascinating that so much B2B translates, and it's because the core and basic skills of good marketing and, and good management are transparent and they, and they fit everyone. If you know how to create great revenue, and if you know how to good, put good leads at the top of the funnel, and you know how to manage people and empower people so that they know how to do their job and they know their guardrails and they know the goals and they know the strategy of the company and they can move toward it, it works for everyone and it transcends any market. And that's why, and it goes all the way back to our first comments about what is the CMO. It doesn't matter where he or she comes from in the industry, it matters that he or she understands how to empower great people to do the job they need to do and to do it well. And it doesn't matter if you're in retail or, or otherwise. So did the board, um, were they looking to go more direct before hiring you or was it because you were yeah. potentially available that that became an it's opportunity? A, it's a kind of funny story. So um, I had actually, <coughs> Channel Advisor is a publicly traded company and so their executives need to sort of have permission to go outside of their daily job to, to touch any other company and do any other kind of work. And so I gained permission to take a board seat at Charles and Colbard. And I thought this was chocolate and peanut butter. Um, I was gonna be a board member at Charles and Colbard and teach them marketing, branding, go-to-market activities, um, e-commerce in particular. How do you become a direct-to-consumer brand? Because I've been doing this now with 2,000 global brands. That's what I was doing every day at Channel Advisor. I could teach this at an oversight and board level at Charles and Colbard, and they could teach me the challenges that it is to be a manufacturer trying to go direct to consumer. It's fraught with, how many of you are manufacturing companies? Any of you? None. So let me tell you a little story. It's so incredibly hard because traditionally a manufacturer creates something, but they don't sell it. You sell it through a channel partner and the channel partner brings it to market. If you're trying to go direct to consumer, you're going around what was your traditional channel partner and now you're kind of competing with them. And I was hoping to solve that issue for companies like Charles and Colbard. If I can get in there at the board level and understand the challenges, I could go back to Channel Advisor and bake it into my product. At the time I was running marketing, product management, and services. So either I can create a service that fixes it or I can create a piece of technology that fixes it. And I Vince came to my first board meeting so excited and all ready to go and the CEO said, I am tendering my resignation. I thought, was it something I said? As it turns out, it was something I said. Um, we talked at length during that very first board meeting about the importance of touch with the buyer and the consumer. And this was a company that only knew, streamlined, how to go through distributorships in order to bring itself to market. And the CEO happened to come from very traditional jewelry, which is one of the most laggard markets that's out there. I've done healthcare, I've done higher ed, uh, I've done state and local government nothing compared to how laggard a, a market the jewelry industry is. And here I came in, guns a blazing, talking about e-commerce and segmenting your market and talking to the consumer and they all glazed over. When the CEO, the then CEO, tendered his resignation, the board said, I think we need to change the game. I think we need to stop thinking about how we can do more of the same and do something very completely different. And perhaps jewelry expertise is not what we need at the helm we actually need marketing expertise at the helm because we need to understand how to market our own brand and have a relationship with that buyer. Um, and that's what we've done over the past um, two and a half years that I've been there. We have completely pivoted the company and what was that traditional company has now, um, we just published Q4 earnings for the first time in company history, our online and direct consumer sales have eclipsed our traditional sales all in a matter of two and a half years and pivot. The consumer wanted it. And the remarkable thing, Vince, is that now my traditional channels are seeing lift. And, and, and at first they argued with me, you're gonna compete with me, I, I'm not gonna do business with you anymore. All the arguments about why channel conflict is gonna happen and we shouldn't be coexisting here, you need to leave us to do the work of bringing your product to market. And the answer was no, let me build the brand for all of us. And it will lift Charles and Colvard, the brand over here, but it'll lift you, the distributors, 
by helping the consumer come to your shop and ask for the product. And then you'll know there's market validation and then you get to lift in your revenue as well. That's awesome. So rising tide, right? It's a rising tide lift all boats. I want to make sure we have enough time for the audience to ask Suzanne some questions. Is there anyone that has a specific question they want to ask Suzanne? Suzanne, how, what's the Amazon effect? Every time I talk to this, oh, uh, it's the Amazon effect. What company was that called? <laughs> Begins with an A, ends with it. Yeah, um, you you must be on Amazon if you're a retail brand. Um, there are some that don't have to, like a, like a Walmart. Of course, is not going to be on Amazon, but they don't have to because they're Walmart. Any other brand that's trying to build a presence for them themselves must be on Amazon. And the reason is this, more than 50% of all product searches begin on Amazon. They don't begin on Google. You think you go to the search engine, right? But you don't, you go to Amazon. How many of you in the room are Prime members? Every single one of you. How many of you in the room use the filter for Prime to make sure that you're buying from a Prime vendor? nearly every single one of you. So if I'm gonna be in the place where all searches begin and I want my brand to be present, I must be on Amazon. And then what a double-edged sword that is. Because once Amazon figures out what the heck this moissanite thing is that I'm bringing to market, they're gonna be interested in being in that market. The good news for us is that we are one of the very few manufacturers of moissanite in the world. Unlike other consumer products that may have multiple, multiple competitors and you kind of share, all share the same um, ID of product and you're competing with each other on price, that's a slippery slope on Amazon. And they can come in and say, you know what, we just want to own paper towels and you're done. And they can do it and they will squash you like the cockroach that you are because they're Amazon and they get to do that. If you own your brand and you do the work similar to what we've been doing and you, um, you establish that the brand itself has value, it's very hard then for Amazon to come along and say, we want to genericize what this product is because the consumer is buying the brand. So incumbent on these organizations is to build your brand and your name recognition, and then you can compete on Amazon and you can own it. But you must play if you're going to be a reality in the market. So excellent question. Other questions? Yeah, what, what troubles the strategic CMO and, and keeps him or her up at night? Um, ultimately, it's whether or not you're adding value for your shareholder. It's not that I'm generating enough marketing leads. It's not that I have the prettiest logo. It's that the people that have invested my, in my company, whether it's private equity or public, um, are they receiving a return on the investment that they made in this company? And what are the measures that get you there? Revenue gets you there. Return on investment gets you there. Uh, multiples get you there. Profitability gets you there. Market share, top line growth gets you there. Whatever kind of investor you have, they're interested in whether or not you're moving their needle. So as a CMO, you must be thinking about the master you serve, and that's ultimately your customer and your investor. And if your customer's crazy happy about the product you're bringing to market and you are authentic, and you told them what they were going to get and they got it and they're happy because they got exactly what, they, what you had pitched to them. And your shareholder is saying, I invested in this company and I'm seeing two, three times my multiple, I'm going to stay in that stock or I'm going to stick with my private um, investment, then you've done your job. Everything else is table stakes. How you get there, the data that gets you there is all part of your job. But what should keep you up at night is whether or not those two constituents are having their needs met. How do, you, how do you convince the traditional that you need to shift? Yeah. Um, I just went through that at Charles and Colvard, and this bloody spot right here, yeah, this is me beating my head against the wall to get there. Sometimes you have to do some major wholesale changes to a business. When I came on board, again, remember, I walked into a traditional manufacturing company. Um, very old thinking about how you do things. It's a Rolodex, but it's literally a Rolodex. Like you, you have these little cards and they fit in a little thing that looks like this and you, you flip them this way and you see different names and they have a phone number on it. And that's how they did business. And um, in, in being blunt, um, sometimes you have to let some people go. And sometimes you have to hire some new blood. And what you, what's incumbent on a leader 
is to discuss the strategy and then talk about all the important things we need to do in order to reach the strategy. And in this pivot, if you want to be on the bus, you need to believe in the strategy and you need to understand your role in the strategy and you need to want to go forward with us and have a positive attitude about how painful it's going to be to do this pivot, but man, it's exciting and we're all going to do this together and it's like we're all in, in the sock race together and we all have one leg in this thing together and we're moving in one direction, right? If you find people are buzzing about things that they don't like and they're trying to throw other people under the bus because this isn't the way we always did this, they're not healthy for your business. And I would say, rip the Band-Aid off and make the tough decisions and make them soon and get the right people in the business because there's nothing worse and more undermining than people that really have no intention to go forward and they're just there to, to collect a paycheck. And so um, all the way from the top, articulate the strategy, tell people what it means to be successful and then ask them if they wanna be on the bus. In my company, there were only 70 seats on the bus. And 70 is a really small number, right? and we're a publicly traded company and we're, we're very open and transparent. I couldn't, I couldn't afford a single seat on the bus to not be going in the direction that we were going. And there were a handful that were not. So rip the Band-Aid, change it wholesale. Okay, we've got time for one last quick question. Anyone else got a question for Suzanne? So how do, we, how do we really find the true strategic CMO? Ask him or her to give examples. And, and ask truly for you know, the, the three to four places where they moved the needle and how did they personally move the needle? How did they measure it? What was the problem that they had? What was the solution that they were going to? Who did they collaborate with? Because if it's all I, 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 they're not collaborating, right? Who do they collaborate with in order to make things happen? How long did it take? What were the clear measurements that showed success? You, you can't really talk a good story if you don't have the data and the numbers. I'm very data driven and I think you should search for CMOs that are very data driven. And it sounds a little bit like I'm, I'm talking the other side of the, of the mouth, right? If you're data driven, aren't you transactional? No, if you're data driven, you're making strategic decisions based on data. And he or she should be able to articulate how that move the needle for shareholders and customers and revenue and all those important measures. Thank you very much, Suzanne. That was awesome. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.